Breaking the News with Des Clark. I am Des Clark and this is Breaking the News, the show that breaks the week's news and asks four opinionated panellists to put it back together again. And joining me this week is comedian and actor Miles Jupp and with him is stand-up and storyteller Marjolaine Robertson and facing off against them is comedian and writer Athena Kuglenu and joining her is stand-up Christopher MacArthur Boyd. In the news this week, Doreen Lofthouse, <laughs> who grew Fisherman's Friends lozenges into a huge global brand, has sadly died at the age of 91. Her funeral service was described as very moving as there was not a dry throat in the church. <laughs> <laughs> a five-year-old on a quad bike caused a scare after he strayed onto the runway at Perth Airport this week. His parents have apologised for the incident, saying it should never have happened as he was supposed to be flying from Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> And a woman who complained to Asda that the daffodils she ordered were missing from her delivery ended up finding them in the fridge after her husband mistook them for spring onions. Thankfully, the couple are now back in speaking terms after the embarrassed husband apologised with a lovely bouquet of asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> right, you've met the panel. Let's crack on with round one. This is the Broken News Round, where our teams have to guess two major stories of the week that have been mashed together into one single news headline. So, Miles and Margulin, can you tell me our first story, please? Shops, gyms and indoor hospitality dominated last night's leaders' debate. The political leaders from Scotland's larger parties clashed over... ...shared frustration about hairdressers and garden centres. They also debated the best way to... ...not visit friends or relatives... ...ahead of this May's Holyrood vote. So, Marjolaine, what do you think her first story might be then? Well, I'm not going to lie. I was gutted I found out this was on the news when I was on Breaking News because I realised I'd have to watch it. It is <laughs> the leaders' debate in Scotland. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is the news that leaders of Scotland's five largest political parties went head-to-head -head earlier this week in their first TV debate ahead of the Holyrood elections in May. The debate saw the SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon, Conservatives Douglas Ross, Labour's Anna Sarwar, Liberal Democrat Willie Rennie and Scottish Greens co-leader Lorna Slater take questions from a virtual audience. Now, for Nicola Sturgeon, this election has been about her chance to regain a majority. For the Conservatives and Labour, it's a battle to be the second biggest party. For the Greens, it's an opportunity to promote climate awareness and for Willie Rennie, it's an excuse to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> no one said anything that I couldn't have written down that I thought they might say. There was, there's nothing big and surprising and nothing to really end it on that cliffhanger moment to make me tune in for episode two. <laughs> <laughs> From a political handling point, that's, that's kind of the right result, isn't it? If anyone had gone in, they, you know, they sit with their teams, they're briefed, and then they go out there and they say the things they're going to say. If people go, I was watching at home, I have to say... That was a bit surprising. Uh, that would be a sort of... <laughs> sort of... <laughs> Athena, what did you make of the first debate that we had? Well, I always get disappointed when I see well-dressed adults standing behind pillars in a semicircle because I'm expecting take me out. And I'm like, <laughs> when, when, they, when are they going to do the no-likey? No, like, come on, get rid, of, get, get rid of the one with the hair that doesn't move. Like, Nicholas Sturgeon's hair doesn't move. Have you noticed this? It's like, what are you using, girl? Gorilla glue. It's, a, it's fantastic. Um, I thought it was really cute that Labour showed up, because I'm like, wow, people are still doing that in Scotland, voting Labour? That's nice. Um, it's, it's like getting up to change the TV channel. Like, no one does that anymore. We have remote controls now, guys. Why are you doing yeah. this? <laughs> Now, in terms of TV debates generally, Miles, do you think that they're useful? No, I think they sort of skewer things, actually. You end up just entirely judging people's personalities based on a kind of small clip of them. It was a television debate, uh, let us remind ourselves, that led to the rise of Clegg mania. Uh, <laughs> they had a few debates. Nick Clegg did quite well in a couple of TV debates. Everyone went, this guy is amazing. Whereas now, of course, they think, oh, this guy... Uh, you know, it's, and, and that's, that's the danger of a TV <laughs> debate, I think. And people already know who they support before they watch them. It's like football, do you know what I mean? Nobody goes to an old firm game thinking, hmm, I'm really looking forward to seeing which soccer player impresses me with their fancy footwork. That will be the player to which I hope will be victorious. It's like, you know who you support already. There's a reason politicians in Britain wear colour-coded ties. So as you go, their tie is my colour. Let's see what kind of damage we can do. <laughs> Obviously, debates have been a hot topic this week and they will be for the coming weeks to come. Marjolaine, what would you win a debate about? 
I am a terrible <coughs> debater. For example, I spent four years studying archaeology, and I mind when I finished my last exam and walked out that exam hall and phoned my brother to be like, I've done it, I've done it. I finished my last exam, it was on the Egyptians, and my brother, who'd just been deep diving into videos on YouTube, was like, yeah, but it was aliens. And I was like... <laughs> I couldn't refute him, and I was so surprised when I passed the exam because I was like, I got it wrong, it was aliens. <laughs> Miles, what do you think that you would win a debate about? This house believes that modern hand dryers are simply far too loud. Um, I, would, I would debate that with a considerable... They are... It's ridiculous. They are so loud. It's too, it's, they're, here, here. they're too loud. Absolutely. I, uh, I want you to be there with that. You want, that like, just a little little towel roll that an old guy comes in and changes once a morning. That's all you need. <laughs> Just stop the noise. Athena, we're talking about debates then. What do you think you could win a debate on? Um, the greatest issue of our time, um, egg mayonnaise sandwiches. Basically, once someone has spoken to me about them, they realise how disgusting they are and that we should just take them out of all of our menus. Um, like, why... You're taking egg, right, egg, and you're covering it in a sauce that is also made out of egg. <laughs> it's wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's disgusting. Cheese and pickle, fine. Contrast, you know. Sausage and ketchup, moisture. Egg and egg, slowly <laughs> breath. Um, Vomit-inducing. It's disgusting. Uh, Lorna Slater said the Green Party will invest in public transport, warming homes and jobs in renewable energy. Uh, very similar to Alaba Party's manifesto, which aims to provide a car, a warm home and a job for Alex Salmond. <laughs> 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 uh, during the debate, the Conservative leader, Douglas Ross, was told to grow up, uh, and he said if there were any more comments like that, he'd take his ball home and get his da. <laughs> um, well done, Miles and Margulene. You get two points for that. And now to you, Athena and Christopher. What was the other story we were after? Oh, this has got to be about lockdown restrictions easing in Scotland. Yeah, absolutely right. Well done. That is the correct answer. It's the news that Scotland's stay-at-home order has been lifted as the country gets set for further restrictions to ease on Monday. Uh, hairdress and garden centres are going to be opening with shops, gyms and some hospitality due to open from the 26th of April. Uh, generally, Athena, are you excited to see restrictions easing? I'm really thrilled because the one thing I've really missed throughout lockdown is the playing of my favourite game, which is where has the Hermes person left my package? Um, you know, it's been no jeopardy for the, the last year. Like, I just open the door and the package is there and I really miss coming home and finding it in the garden, in the bin, in the neighbour's flower bush. So um, I'm really looking forward to playing Hermes bingo. That's, uh, that's thrilling for me. What about you, Christopher, are you excited to see restrictions easing? Yes. And also, no, like, am I excited to exercise my personal freedoms and see my friends and get back to work? Yes. Am I excited to show off how horrifically I've aged in the last year <laughs> as my proverbial <laughs> fruit has rotted on the vine? <laughs> no. <laughs> I do my big shop and the lady at the till's like, do you need a bag? And I'm like, no, just stick them in the ones under my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marjolein, where do you stand in this one? Are you excited to see the restrictions starting to ease off now? I was, until I watched the leaders' debate and I saw six folk all standing together speaking in a room. And when I saw what it's like, I thought, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, the restrictions are easing at a time when you have sort of nothing to do anyway. So you kind of want... You think, could we have an overlap where we still don't have anything to do, but we can do anything? That's kind of <laughs> what I would be looking forward to. Like the old days when, you know, you'd, you'd just sit in a pub until the table was just covered in glasses, all the ashtrays were full, and you'd think, well, that's been a really good, useful afternoon. <laughs> 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 We look forward to a future beyond COVID-19. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has joined more than 20 world leaders in calling for a new global settlement to help the world prepare for future pandemics. But Athena, what would you include in your post-pandemic treaty? Oh, I'd address the mistake we made the first time around. It was a big mistake. Um, we didn't shield the hairdressers. Um, <laughs> we, we shielded them medically. <laughs> we, sh <laughs> we were like, yeah, let's, let's deal with the medically vulnerable. But actually, who are we really going to miss? It's the hairdressers. Get them vaccinated first, you know, get them sorted, get them the PPE and have them do home visits because it was too much. <laughs> it was too much. Marjolaine, what would you like to see and be included in your post-pandemic treaty? I think for it to work, we truly need to understand each other's countries. So mind that show, it's called Wife Swap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so you get leaders from some countries and you pop them in other countries so they can actually learn about how their countries are run and what makes them work. Like Boris in Germany having to actually tuck his shirt in and brush his hair. <laughs> and then Angela Merkel would be here in Shetland drinking in the boating club and lambing sheep at springtime. And I don't know <laughs> why he made her a crafter in Shetland, but it was either that or a fisherman. And uh, Europe's already got enough of our fish. <laughs> <laughs> Miles, what are you thinking? Post-pandemic treaties, what would you include in there? Well... I mean, it's hard in a way to find what would be the sort of legal language for this, but essentially, <laughs> I think that we need to start completely disregarding the opinions of people who are obviously idiots. <laughs> now, that's, I don't know how you put that. I don't know how you put that within a sort of le legally acceptable language. But we know who the idiots are, and we do, we do not need to listen to them. <laughs> How lovely! I don't know what that's. I don't know what that's done to your listening figures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicola Sturgeon has confirmed that Scotland's stay-at-home lockdown order has been lifted, which is great news, particularly if you have an ankle tag. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of that round, the teams are on two points apiece. <laughs> Now, so much of our news is about public opinion, and this week we spoke to tennis coach Judy Murray and columnist Brian Taylor. So, Athena and Christopher, what story do you think Judy is on about here? This has become a really big issue. I see it a lot when I'm out walking the dog. It's a real bugbear of mine, this. I really can't stand people who do this. I'd impose fines for sure and community service, and guess what I'd make them do is their community service? She was either talking about joggers who continue to jog in place at traffic lights and breathe all over the place <laughs> or uh, i think it's litter litter is the right answer big story this week well done christopher it is the news that a scottish community has rallied together to rid their town of litter 80 residents of lone head took part in a mammoth cleanup targeting local green spaces this comes amidst concerns about the amount of littering that will occur post lockdown as people start to gather outside with friends and family scottish lands and estates have made a plea for the public to pick up after themselves and councils are warning about the increase in casual littering so there you go if you do need to dump an item please at least wear a shirt and tie so <laughs> with all this talk of littering and judy's very passionate about it is it a big issue around where you're from christopher uh i it is actually uh, i live just off a main road and it's a fly tipping hotspot it really bums me out because people leave whole mattresses <laughs> and every time i see a mattress on a pavement i get like the uncontrollable urge to like run and do a forward flip onto them <laughs> <laughs> and every time I don't do it, I like myself less. So it's like really having a it's really taking its toll on me. Recycling should be considered because see, when I was growing up, where I was from, if somebody just dumped loads of tiles in the park, suddenly you've got a new adventure playground. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Quite be resourceful. In Shetland, actually, we have the Vore Red Up, and Vore Red Up translates to spring clean, I suppose. Mm. And it's UK's most successful litter pickup, where over twenty percent of the Shetlanders get involved, go outside and pick up litter. It's really, really good. I've done it every year, apart from. One year when I was just about to perform for the last time in the Shetland Filler of the Year competition, and Dad said I couldn't afford to get needles in my fingers. And the next day, I came third in a category of three contestants. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there maybe is a bigger question here then. It's how do you solve the problem of littering? Christopher, any thoughts you have on this? In Japan, litter is non-existent because their culture values, like conforming and, and working as a cog in a greater machine, whereas, you know, British culture is largely spite-based. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we all kind of need to learn to love each other a wee bit more and care about how... We all live as part of the same ecosystem, but we, we, we just really want to say, if it's dirty for me, it'll be dirty for you. I don't want to find a bin, do you know what I mean? Like, it's that type of <laughs> hatred towards our fellow men. So, obviously, littering, we've established, is a problem. Miles, how would you solve it? Basically, there should be a packaging tax. You know, and, you know, if you buy anything that you need scissors to open, it's already got too much <laughs> packaging. So, the other thing is just that, you know, uh, publicly funded waste removal provision, uh, which is... I, honestly, I've got so many T-shirts with that on as a slogan. Um, I'm very, very, very big on it. <laughs> what would you do, Athena, to solve the problem of littering? 
Well, the one thing that's consistent in the UK, wherever you go, is all the, our cities are blighted with chicken bones. It's chicken bone letter. People going out eating their chicken and dropping the bones. You know, like, you know how you get... <laughs> It's just the truth. It's not funny. It's terrible. But you know how you get seedless. You know how you get seedless grapes, right? Let's breed boneless chicken, right? Oh. And let's do away with bones and chickens. Just flop, have them, just flop around. Um, and yeah, and that's how I would solve litter in the UK: boneless chickens. <laughs> what kind of standard of life would a boneless chicken have? <laughs> Yes, the community clear up and concerns about littering is the correct answer. And two points go to Athena and Christopher. So to you, Miles and Marjolaine, what do you think Brian is talking about here? What are the so-called experts? No, I remember them at university. They were on the randan most of the time. And now they're telling us what to do and what to look out for. I remember checking one day and I went through all the details and I convinced myself I only had one arm. That's not right. Who knows most about your body? Yourself. <laughs> Next patient, please. Oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Miles Jop, what do you think that Brian was talking about then? I suspect he's talking about people that um, uh, try and self-diagnose um, medical issues. Yes, it's the news that using online resources to research symptoms may not be harmful after all and could even lead to modest improvements in diagnosis. That is according to a recent study from Harvard University, though, of course, we always recommend getting the appropriate advice from your doctor. Yes, the internet is full of people who think the world is flat, despite the evidence that it's actually round. I've decided to adopt the same mentality to my lockdown weight gain. <laughs> <laughs> Miles, are you guilty of this, looking online for your symptoms? Sometimes. Like 95% of the time you go to a doctor, the doctor's job is to say, you're fine. <laughs> it is. You feel better, but you know people go to be reassured. You know that's uh, they, doctors. If you're in a doctor's surgery, they're always tapping away at their keyboards, aren't you? Get make sure you can get somewhere you can see the screen. There's no evidence that they're not googling themselves. <laughs> 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 Athena, are you guilty of searching for your symptoms online? I'm guilty of searching for symptoms I don't have um, because I, you know, sometimes when you want to call in sick, you want to get creative. You know, I'll, I'll search for something. I don't want something that's going to make people worried and start a GoFundMe, but I do want something that will make people think, oh, she can't come in today. <laughs> yes. uh, Christopher MacArthur Boyd, we're talking about looking up symptoms online. Dr Google, are you guilty of this? What I do is I find out what's wrong with me and then I tell my GP and that saves them time. <laughs> Uh, I'm booking in an appointment after this recording to tell my doctor that according to Google, I'm going through something called the menopause. <laughs> <laughs> Margulene, we're all online these days. What else do you waste time looking up then? I've fallen into a hole on YouTube looking up uh, videos of meditation and awakening your third eye, like transcendental meditation. And what I found is that I go to do a little meditation of 10 minutes and then I pass out for four hours. So God knows what my soul has been up to, but I've been sleeping. <laughs> uh, in the last week, there has been a significant increase in people looking up severely blocked arteries, or as it's more commonly known, the Suez Canal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the potential benefits of looking up symptoms online is the right answer. And well done. Two points go to Miles and Marjolaine. You're tuned to a socially distant breaking the news on BBC Radio Scotland with me, Des Clark. And this round is all about who's in the news. So I will play you a clip of a mystery person. All you have to do is tell me who it is. So Miles and Marjolaine, you're up first this time. Who is this? I have had many embarrassing moments in my career. My willingness to be embarrassed, I think, has been an asset and, and something I've been ready to explore ever since I started out. That's Louis Theroux, and he's done a new documentary all about uh, the Tiger King. Mm. And I don't know how we're going to break it to him that Netflix did this at the beginning of lockdown already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well done. It is Louis Theroux. Louis will be back on our screens this Monday after returning to America to make a new feature-length film about Tiger King's Joe Exotic. The pair first met a decade ago when Theroux was making America's Most Dangerous Pets. And as this round is about Louis Theroux, I'm not going to ask you any questions. I'll just stand silently in the background and occasionally raise an eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> what I did find funny was that he's also making a documentary on snooker. He said, was it, um, he remembers, he's old enough to remember everyone in his school talking about snooker the day after it had been on the telly. 
And I was just thinking, in my primary school, the peak sophisticated <laughs> discussions would be us reenacting Zoe and Cat's iconic moment from EastEnders, <laughs> where Zoe's all like, you ate my mother! It's like, yes, I am! <laughs> <laughs> Athena, why do you think Louis done so well? What makes him such a good interviewer, then? He will interview anyone. <laughs> That's yeah. I, uh, but I, I, yeah, he's friendly. Um, he's the kind of person who you, you talk to him and you think, I'm not going to like tell him my innermost secrets. But some, there's something about him that can elicit everyone's dark secret thoughts. I have no idea how he does yeah. it. He like, must be a witch or something. He's a, yeah, exactly, his witch yeah. He is a master there. Uh, he's back on our screens as Louis Theroux. Christopher MacArthur Boyd, are you excited by this? I like Louis Theroux, but I just don't think there's much uncovered ground with the Tiger King. Like, I didn't watch a documentary about a blind tamer with a mullet who is also an ordained minister <laughs> who hired an undercover <laughs> FBI agent to murder his nemesis, Carol Baskin, and go, there must be more to this guy's story. <laughs> 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 what don't we know about him? So what do you think Louis Theroux's next subject in a documentary should be about? I would, I'd love to watch something called um, Being Des, in which Louis <laughs> Theroux, you know, finally gets to the bottom of the, the enigma uh, that is Scottish entertainment Goliath Des Clark. Um, you know, what... <laughs> What makes him tick? What drives you, Des? What is, I mean, what like? <laughs> what's the motivation? Dot, 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 what's the fee? <laughs> <laughs> Christopher, what do you think Louis Theroux's next documentary should be about? I would love for Louis Theroux to do an expose on the mouse who lives behind my washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to behind the washing machine where Jerry the mouse likes to rustle around and freak out Christopher while he watches wrestling at three in the morning. <laughs> I just want to hear his side of the story because yeah. you know, I hate him, but yeah, I don't know him. And I just like to see the other side of him. <laughs> Yeah, two points, Miles and Marjolaine, that was Louis Theroux. Right, Athena and Christopher, it's your turn now. Who is this and why are they in the news? It's pretty scary at times and um, it's not at all what it's like now. It was all-encompassing and you know what it's like when you're at school, you kind of see other kids and you're like, do you haven't got this whole thing of just inviting all these people into your garden once a year? That's got to be Emily Evis, uh, who's running an online Glastonbury, I think, this year. Yeah, right answer. Well done for picking up on the clues. It is Emily Evis. Emily has announced that she is planning a live stream concert from Worthy Farm this year after the Glastonbury Festival was cancelled for the second year in a row. Glastonbury organiser Emily Evis has planned to live stream a concert from Worthy Farm in May. It means that fans won't have to queue for the toilet unless your mum's having a bath. So, <laughs> uh, alternative situation. <laughs> alternative situation for Glastonbury this year, Athena. Do you think that Emily has come up with a good Good solution for Glastonbury? Well, it's not very original because, you know, we've been performing online doing stand-up for a whole year. So if people are congratulating her, it's like, hold on a minute, guys. I've been performing to 50 people <laughs> in my living room. And actually, because I have been, if, if Coldplay, if Haim, if Rihanna, if they want any advice on, as to how to perform for an online audience, my DMs are open. Because it's hard, man. When you, perf <laughs> when you perform for people online, you're competing with their fridges. So you've got to have a bit more charisma <laughs> and energy. And I can, I can, I'm after to chat to Chris Martin about all that. So, yeah. Uh, Christopher, obviously, we've been doing streaming. Do you think this is a good solution being that the festival itself can't take place this year uh, no <laughs> uh, <laughs> straight in <laughs> People don't go to music festivals for the music. People go to music festivals because day-to-day -day life is absolute drudgery. Mm -hmm. And a music festival is like a temporary autonomous zone where hedonism is not just acceptable but encouraged. And that's a difficult vibe to pull off in a Zoom call. Do you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Miles, it's obviously Emily Evis' solution for Glastonbury this year. Do you think it's a good one? I think it'll have to do, Des. Uh, I, 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 I'm not prepared to go further than that. <laughs> that's all I, we're committing if that, to. If, that, if, that, if that's what it is, that's, that, 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 that will have to do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to describe your dream festival, what would it be like? So my dream festival <laughs> is one where they literally bake the biggest bannock they can possibly bake, which is kind of like a savoury scone. Mm -hmm. They have a butter churning race, and they race tractor engines, and you have to stop halfway through to down pints and then continue again. Mm -hmm. And that's called the Big Bannock, and it happens in Shetland when there's no COVID. So that's an actual festival that does happen? <laughs> yeah, the local fire <laughs> engine has to come so that they can shoot the racers with the hose to try and slow them down with the pressure. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is amazing. I mean, that's just a water cannon, basically, isn't it? That's like sort of. Perhaps is there a bit where people get kettled as well? <laughs> <laughs> there is a tea room. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Evis is the right answer and two points goes to Miles and Marjoling and it's time now for our final quick fire round which is all about deciphering the numbers in the news so I will read out a headline all the teams have to do is fill in the blanks so get ready teams when we run out of time you'll hear this are you ready for international stardom? that is Gary Robertson they're auditioning to be the next host of Drag Race UK let's go for it <laughs> <laughs> More than 452,000 people did what in 2020? Tried to rent Netflix from Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more than 452,000 people did what in 2020? Is it added a portion of potato wedges to their takeaway in order to meet the minimum spend for delivery? <laughs> 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 More than 452,000 people did what in 2020? Uh, put a pair of pants on their head, then stood on the landing screaming, I have nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> More than 452,000 people did what in 2020? It might be what I did, and that was proposed to my hairdresser. Um, never again will we be separated. Never. <laughs> More than 442,000 people did what in 2020? Is it pulled their joggies up to their shoulders and pretended they were a head with legs? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant answers, not quite nailing the right one from the news this week, which is that more than 452,000 people visited Edinburgh's Royal Botanic Garden in 2020. Are you ready for international stardom? Oh, there we go. That is our klaxon and Gary has Robertson. It means it's all over. And at the end of the quiz, our winners this week are Athena Kugblenu and Christopher MacArthur Boyd. Woo! Yes! And commiserations to Miles Jopp and Marjolaine Robertson. Hey. And we'll leave you with the breaking the news. Breaking news, Justin. Ghost hunters have been fined for breaking COVID-19 lockdown rules after they met at a spooky derelict building. They insisted it was OK because there was only six of them, but police said they'd forgot to count the pale Victorian child singing nursery rhymes in the corner. <laughs> Ex-GMTV fitness guru, Mr Motivator, has revealed that he owns 500 bum bags. Now he just needs to remember which one that he put his car keys in. <laughs> and a theatre company has been forced to postpone its staging of a Shakespeare classic due to fears that Romeo and Juliet cannot observe social distancing. Well, if family feuds, plagues on your house and your pal getting murdered aren't enough to keep you apart, then there's no way they're going to listen to Jason Leach. <laughs> <laughs> the news is broken. I've been Des Clark. Goodbye. Hey. Hey.